All Saints Day is a day for remembering all the saints. Uh, both those that we know traditionally. So think of some saints that you, that you know of. Maybe the apostles, right? We think of uh, you know, St. Andrew, St. Peter, St. Paul. Um, we think maybe you have a patron saint or a, a saint that you have particular affinity for. Like I, I love St. Francis, uh, and, and I, I look to him as an example in, in my life. Maybe there's somebody like that for you that you can think of. We also celebrate on this day the ones that we don't know about as well. So when we think of saints, we, we are often, um, I think rightly so, thinking of people that have lived some kind of exemplary uh, Christian life. And this is a really biblical idea, actually. Um, if you were to, say, go to Hebrews 11, you would have a whole chapter in the Bible that is just recounting uh, the, the faith of a bunch of people throughout the history of the people of God that we are to look to as an example. And of course, all of these individuals also warn us by their bad examples, too. So saints are never just kind of perfect people, but they are people that, uh, that we look to as, uh, as an example. Now, all souls is different from all saints, because when we think about all souls as a holiday or as a celebration in the church, it's about all the faithful, all the faithful departed, regardless. Um, but I still think of, so when I think of all souls, I start to think of those people in my life that, you know, maybe they weren't officially canonized. Maybe they're not uh, famous in any particular way, but, um, but they still lived a, a faithful life uh, to the Lord. And, um, and that inspires me even today and encourages me even today. I think, especially in my own family, I think of my great-grandparents. I called them Daddy George and Mimi. And I think about their, uh, their life of faithfulness to the Lord over many, many years and how that influence is all, has been poured out all the way down to my children. Right? I think about my grandfather. I called him Papa, uh, who uh, passed away just a few years ago. And you know he wasn't a perfect person. But he had a life, an overall life of faithfulness to the Lord that I still remember often, uh, almost daily. Um, I remember Papa in my prayers. So that's kind of what it's about today. We're, we're celebrating that God doesn't just call us also as individuals, but he calls us as a whole people that influence one another, that encourage one another that uh, bring one another uh, to the throne of heavenly grace, if you will. That's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day, All Saints Day. And I'm so glad that we have it in our Christian tradition. And I'm glad we get to celebrate it today. As we're thinking about that, and as we are thinking about our passage from Ephesians today, our epistle, I want you to think about three things that we can know about saints generally. Now, I'm not at all taking away, and again, I think it is a good thing that we remember certain specific people that lived unique and exemplary lives, and we call them saints, and we remember them, we look to them. That's okay. But I don't want our uh, beliefs and thoughts and attitudes around saints to be solely confined to that, and this is why, because the Bible doesn't solely confine the concept of saint to that. So let's just talk about three things here. The first thing that I want you to know is if you are a Christian, you are a saint. If you are a Christian, you are a saint. Remember, saint just means holy one, and holy one just means set apart from others for a special purpose. Now, how do you know you've been set apart? Well, in verse 13, Ephesians 1 and 13, listen to this. In him, in Christ, in him, you also, talking about a, a whole church here, the church in Ephesus, a whole church in a whole city, so we can apply this to ourselves as well. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, set apart spirit. Saintly spirit, if you will. How do you know you've received the Holy Spirit to make you a holy one? Well, St. Paul says you received him when you heard the truth and believed. 
So you can know you're a saint if you've heard the truth and believed. This is the inward grace that we mark with an outward sign of water baptism. And after baptism, we often anoint with oil. It's called chrism. And we say, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. So if you're a Christian, you're a saint. Second thing, if you're a saint, you receive riches in the church with other saints. Now we're going to have to qualify this. Here's what, uh, here's what Paul says in, in verses 15 through 18. For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? God, there's something about this, that there is an inheritance that belongs to God, which is his saints, that we uh, participate in, that we receive also, that we receive benefits from. So what are those riches? in the saints that we could think of. What would be the preached word of God would be one of those riches. The correction that we offer one another, the love that we share with each other, the joy of knowing more of God as we know more of Christ in one another. As we receive that spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of our hearts enlightened to see Christ. So if you're a saint, you share in these riches in a, in a special way. You're a member of the church. So if you're a Christian, you're a saint. If you're a saint, you receive riches in his kingdom, which is the fellowship of the Holy Spirit with one another. And then third... This church, this group of saints, is the body of Christ. You have to know this. And th this is a wonderful metaphor, for sure. The, the whole body idea, the body of Christ, that we each uh, play a part. You know, there are many members, one body, many members. Maybe you've heard that sermon before. I've probably preached it a few times as the rector of this church. What a beautiful idea. But it is so much more than a metaphor. Friends, there is something profoundly concrete about this idea that the saints are the body of Christ. There is something profoundly tangible in this. Listen to what St. Paul says here. After he says, you know, I want you to know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. And listen to this, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I don't understand it, but there it is. There it is. Somehow, despite our incredible confusions, our divisions, our even rebellion against the Lord, and on and on as Christians, when we nevertheless hear the word and believe it and receive the Holy Spirit, the fullness of Christ is manifest in us. And this is how 
he will continue to fill the earth through his people until there is no person, place, or thing that is not radiant with the glory of his indwelling presence. Once again, I can't explain it, but there it is. It's a truth that moves us into grateful worship, I think. When we meditate on this, these three things that, that are in the scriptures, that if you're a Christian, you're a saint. If you're a saint, you have the riches of the body of Christ. And if you're part of the body of Christ, the fullness of Christ dwells in you to go out into the world, to fill the world. When you meditate on those things, goodness gracious, how can that not move you to worship, friends? What a good God. That, that we give thanks that sainthood isn't based on our intrinsic goodness, actually, or our miracle-working power. But it's just in simply believing and trusting. Believing and trusting what God has done for the world in Christ. And so we worship him because seeing our tendency to drift away from him, God sets us back on track to life in him for the sake of the world by coming to us in his son, Jesus Christ. And Christ himself as divinity made flesh is the ultimate chosen one. We can think of Jesus as the ultimate saint, if you will. Chosen by God, the ultimate holy one, set apart uniquely to deal with all the things that separate us from God because only he could do it. In his divinity, Christ deals definitively with the curse of death that we bring on ourselves by our sins, by our selfish and self-destructive attitudes and actions and affections and by dying for us on the cross, by forgiving us from our sins, by forgiving those that nailed him to the cross, he unleashes divine forgiveness on humanity. And then rising from the grave and ascending into heaven, he opens the gates of heaven to all believers, the gates of his kingdom to all believers. As we simply respond to Christ's invitation to come and receive eternal life, we find, amazingly, that we are chosen in him. When Christ chooses, when God chose Christ, he chose us. So what does this mean for your life today? It means, well, you are a saint. Or if you're not today, you can be one. Yeah, this is the one this is the one time where joining the crowd is a good thing. Join join that crowd around the throne of God that worships him forever because of everything that he's done for us. But you know, you can be a saint in kind of this objective sense and maybe kind of know all this stuff in your head but not let it work its way out into your life and into your into your heart. So, so let it work work into your life and into your heart. Three things you can know today. Three things that this, that this means for you today. First of all, knowing that you're chosen by God in Christ means that you can know that you are secure now and forever. That you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. That nothing can separate you from your maker and from the good destiny that he has for you. If you are a saint, Paul says in Romans, Paul says, <laughs> who shall bring any charge against God's elect? That means his chosen ones. So think about this. You're one of his chosen ones in Christ. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. 
who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who is raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. But no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you're a saint, you're secure in the love of God. Second thing. If you're a saint, you know you have a family. So important in today's day and in age. It's important in every day and age. But our families fall apart. Our families are um, can be beautiful, can be also incredibly toxic places. But if you're a saint, and, and the family of God can also be a toxic place, so don't get me wrong. <laughs> family of God can also be toxic. But if you're a saint, we have this hope that we can live in a healthy family, that we can be adopted children of God and we can act like it and we can treat one another like that. We can live in that, the best kind of family. Third thing, you have a purpose. You're secure, you have a family and you have a purpose, which is to fill your corner of the world with Christ's presence in you by letting him direct your thoughts and your allegiances and your actions. And don't overcomplicate this. Pray. Ask the Lord to guide you and to fill you with his Holy Spirit. Turn your heart to him. Love him, as we say, as Jesus said, love the Lord, your God, and love your neighbor. And you'll find yourself filling your corner of the world with the very presence of Christ. All this is so wonderful, I think. What a cause for joy this morning. But as we remember the dead too, those that have gone before us, we remember that the, the veil that separates us can be and is often mercifully thin, if you will. But it is nevertheless there. There is a real separation between me and those that I have lost temporarily to physical death. I miss being pulled in the wagon by my daddy George. I miss going for a drive with Papa when he was a real quiet guy, so we never said anything. But just being together knowing that this guy loves me unconditionally. I miss those things. It, and I don't have them in the same way, right? The veil is real. I can't wait to see Daddy George and Papa again. We, so we eagerly wait and hope for the resurrection. And that's a big part of, I think, uh, uh, a good celebration of all saints is to remember that the reason we can celebrate is because of the resurrection, because we have this hope of eternal life with all the saints. We also, on all saints, I think, have an opportunity to entrust those whose sainthood seems uncertain to us, to him. So there are people that we have lost or that we maybe even now, maybe we haven't lost them to physical death, but there is some kind of relational distance between us. And we don't know whether they are sainted, if you will, or not. But it's an opportunity for us to entrust even those people into the loving arms of a God and a Christ who said, that when he was lifted up, he would draw all people to himself. And that even in this passage that we find will be all in all 
Now, this doesn't mean that we get to make final judgments on anybody, but it does mean that we can live in hope even in these areas of uncertainty. And so on uh, this All Saints Day, if you are grieving a loss or, or a distance from a loved one, no matter who it is or, or how long it's been, I want to actually do something a little different today than we do on a normal Sunday morning for All Saints. I, I want to invite you after we pass the piece in a couple of minutes to come forward. So just during the piece, shake your hand, wave, give somebody a hug or whatever, then come, come up here. And I would like you to join me back here behind the altar during the celebration. Now, this isn't some kind of magic. <laughs> this is a kind of magic thing. I'm not going to promise you that you're going to have some kind of uh, uh, crazy spiritual vision or experience or something because you're close to the altar. I know, it would be nice if we could guarantee those things. But I do just want to mark it out that on this day, that when we join together in worship, um, we are united in a special way with all the saints. With St. Francis, St. Uh, Mother Teresa, St. Mother Teresa, St. Peter, St. Paul, with our grandparents, with our spouses, our loved ones, with Christ. When we worship together, we're united in that special way. And I want to mark that out. So again, you are invited and encouraged to come and stand with me right behind the altar as we celebrate the Eucharistic prayer in just a few moments. It's a special day today, and I'm glad we get to share it together as we recognize the union and the hope that all saints, known and unknown, living and dead, share in our Lord Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen.